Do you want to know how to play Catan in the easiest way? Let me show you how. Hi players, bonjour from Paris. My name is Asaf Hirsch and welcome to my channel Easy Board Games. Today I'm going to show you how to play the game Catan by Klaus Tuber. This is a 3-4 player game. And before you're slicing map in the comments, I do know that there are some extensions that allow you to uh, play the game at a higher player count. But in this video, I'm only going to show you how to play the basic game. A couple of things before we're getting started. Uh, the first one is that the copy of the game that I have is the French version from 2017. So you might see a few differences between the copy in the video and the one that you have back at home. Uh, for example, the French language, a shocker, right? Uh, and another thing uh, will be the starting position of the white player, uh, but nothing too serious. And once you get the hang of the game, the principles of it, you'll be able to just fly through it. Second thing is that in this video, I'm only going to present you guys the basic game with the basic rule set and the basic setup. So I'm pretty much just going to follow the diagram that you received with your uh, game rules or with something attached to it because of course the French have to do everything differently but I'm just going to follow it and show you the basic uh, setup. I am going to talk about the advanced setup option but just a little bit further down the road. Uh, feel free to jump to it at any time with a timestamp but I do highly recommend that for the first few games that you do or if you're teaching someone the game stick to the basic rule set, it's going to be much easier and much more balanced. Ready to build some cities and settlements? Let's go to setup. Let's orient the frame, so number three is in front of us or towards the north, since we're on an island of course. And make sure that the corresponding numbers are to the left and to the right, which means that number three is next to number three, number four is next to number four, and so on until the hexagon is complete. After the frame, we will start laying down the tiles. And the last part, we're going to put on the tiles the number that correspond to them. Each player will now choose a color and will take four cities, five settlements, 15 roads, and one of these cards that is called the building cost card. In the next step, each player will place two settlements and two roads. Pay attention that each settlement is going to be placed on the crossroads of three hexagon, and the road will be placed on the line between two hexagons. After all the players have placed their settlements and roads, it's supposed to look like this. For each player, one of these settlements is the starting settlement. In the case of the blue player, it will be this one, this one for the yellow, and this one for the white player. It is all indicated in the diagram by a letter or a star, depends which version of the game you have. And last but not least, don't forget to put the thief on the desert tile. Next to the board, we will create a resource bank. It consists bricks, lumber, ore, grain, and wool. The last deck of cards is going to be the development cards, but we will talk about it a little bit later. Then we'll put here the dice and the two special cards. One of them is the longest road and the other one is the largest army. Each player will now take the three resources adjacent to his starting settlement. In the case of the blue player, it will be one ore, one brick, and one wood. So we finished setup, and I truly believe in this channel that in order for you to learn how to play, I just need to show you how it goes. So I created a small tutorial of a three-player game with, uh, let me present to you Mr. Schwett over here. And uh, since I couldn't find anything else, yeah, I know, but don't hold it against me, okay? Let's get to it. So, according to the basic rule set, the oldest player starts, and since obviously I'm much older than Mr. Schwett and Mr. Onion over here, I will be the starting player. Now, the first thing in each player's turn that you have to do is to roll the dice for the resource production phase. So, let's do it. 
and I have a 10. Now we're looking for the tiles that have the number 10. We have it over here and we have it over here. Now we're looking to see if there's any settlement adjacent to these tiles. So in this case over here of the mountains, there is no settlement that is adjacent to it. On this case, on the other hand, Mr. Onion, the yellow player, has a settlement that is adjacent to this tile. And for this, he will receive one brick. After we have resolved the resource production phase, we have a few other options to do on our turn. The first one is trading, so let's take a moment to look at it. We have two options to do for trading. The first one is domestic trading, which means that the active player, in this case me, can trade resources with other players. For the sake of this tutorial, all the resources are face up, but in the case of a real game, they will be face down and they will be hidden from other players. The second option of trading is the maritime trading. The most basic form of this trading is if I take four resources of the same kind, I just deposit in the resource bank and I will take any other resource that I would like. The second form of this trading is if I have a settlement on a harbor. Let's take a moment to see what is a harbor. A harbor is any corner that shows one of these small pictures of a dock. The first type of harbor is the three to one, which means just like we saw before, but instead of four resources, I just need to give three. The second type of harbor is a specific one, which means that I can trade in a ratio of two to one, but with this specific resource that is indicated on the board. In this example, it will be two lumber. For my turn, I'm pretty happy with the cards that I have, so I'm not interested in trading anything with Mr. Schwett or Mr. Onion. And soon enough, you'll see why. So let's talk about the second option of what we can do in our turn, and that is building. So when we look at the building cost card, we have a few options. The first one is to build a road, the second one is to build a settlement, and the third one is to upgrade, pay attention, upgrade, not build, a city from a settlement. The fourth option, which is the development cards, we'll talk about soon enough. So let's now talk about the settlement. When we want to build a settlement, we need to keep in mind two rules. The first rule is the distance rule, which means that when I want to build a settlement, I need to make sure that there are no other settlements around it. In this case, this will be an invalid place to put a settlement, since next to it there is another one, and it doesn't matter if it's mine or belongs to another player. The second rule that we need to keep in mind when building a settlement is that it has to be connected to another road, which means that this location will also be invalid because maybe it holds the first rule of the distance since there are no other settlements around it, but it is not connected to any other road. So for example, if I had another road over here, then a settlement over here would have been great because it is connected to another road and there are no other settlements around it. After talking about the settlements, let's go back and talk about roads. As you already guessed it, we need roads in order to build later some new settlements. So this is what I'm going to do on my turn. So when we're looking at the building cost card, we're seeing that building a road will cost us one brick and one lumber. So this is exactly what I'm going to take. <clears throat> I'm going to pay one lumber and one brick. And I'm going to put this road over here. Now, this video is not at all about giving you any kind of strategic advices, but just to let you know that I'm building this road here to connect it later to this area, which will give me the possibility to do trade in a ratio of three to one. Since there is nothing else left for me to do on my turn, I'm going to pass the dice to the player on my left, which in this case is Mr. Onion. He's going to roll the dice since it's the first thing that he needs to do. And we see that the result is a three. So now we're going to look where we have three on which tile. And we see that we have over here in the forest. So Mr. Schwett over here, the, the, sorry, the white player is going to take 
one lumber. And on the other three, me and Mr. Onion are going to take one ore. So one ore for him and one ore for me. So when Mr. Onion is checking his options on the board, he's going to see that he can do a few things. First of all, he can build a road just like I did, but in this case, he will need one lumber that he doesn't have right now. So he can trade, for example, with Mr. Schwett. The other interesting thing that I would like to show you is how to upgrade a settlement into a city. Now for Mr. Onion, we can see that he has two ore, two grain and one brick. That means that he doesn't have enough resources to trade directly with a resource bank since he doesn't have four resources of the same kind. In order for him to upgrade one settlement into one city, he will need two grain and three ore, but he only has two. So the other option that he has is to trade with another player. It doesn't mean that any one of us would like to trade with him, but of course, for the sake of this tutorial, we will do it in any case. And Mr. Schwett is right on it, and he's going to give him one ore. There you go in order to give him back another brick. Now for Mr. Schwett is not so bad since he has now enough resources in order to build another road. So Mr. Onion will be happy to upgrade one of his settlements into a city. Now there are two benefits in doing that. The first benefit is that when we're looking at the building cost card, we can see that a city is worth two victory points while a settlement is worth one victory point. So I'm guessing this is one victory point closer to the 10 needed in order to win the game. The second benefit is that when we're upgrading one of the settlements into a city, the next time someone will roll one of those numbers that is now adjacent to the newly built city, Mr. Onion is going to receive not one, but two of these resources. So let's say that on the next round, Mr. Schwett over here is going to roll a four or a six. Then Mr. Onan will receive two grain instead of the ordinary one when you have a settlement. So this is exactly what Mr. Onan would like to do. And he's going to pay all the resources needed, which means three ore and two grain. And there you go. Mr. Onan has nothing else left to do on his turn. And he's going to pass the dice to the player on his left, which is Mr. Schwett. And Mr. Schwett is rolling the dice and we have a six. So let's see what's going to happen now. So all over the six here, we see that Mr. Schwett is going to receive one brick. So there you go. And over here, we can see that we have a six also. So with our newly built city, Mr. Onion is going to have two grain. Now, Mr. Schwett is deciding to do two things. First of all, he would like to build a road. So we already know how it works. He's going to pay the cost, which is one lumber and one brick. He will take one of his roads and he will decide to put it over here, which is, by the way, brings him a lot closer to be the settlement on a harbor with a ratio of two to one with lumber. The second thing that he would like to do <clears throat> in order for us to advance in this tutorial is to buy a development card. Now, in order to do that, if we're looking at the building cost card, at the last option, we see that it costs one ore, one wool, and one grain. So he will do a little bit of a trade, Mr. Schwett, here with us, the other players, and we're going to, uh, we're going to allow this since we do want to keep moving with this tutorial. So Mr. Schwett is going to replace one lumber for one grain with Mr. Onion. And over here, one brick for me and one ore for him. Now, just for you to know, even if he wanted to build two roads, he can do that since he had the, all the resources needed for two roads. He had two lumber and two brick, which is now what he replaced. Now, with these three resources that he has, he's going to buy a development card. And obviously it will be a great time talking about de development cards. So we have three types of development cards. Let's take a look. 
The first type of the development card that we have is a progress card, which is basically a card that we have a text on, we need to resolve it, and then we just throw it from the game. In this specific card, it's called invention, which means take two resources of your choice from the resource bank. The next type of card that we have is a victory point card, which is very straightforward. It means that it's just worth one victory point. The last type of card that we have in the development card is a knight card, but we'll talk about it just in a few more seconds when we'll explain what happens when someone rolls a seven. Just as a reminder, all the development cards need to be shuffled and face down. So Mr. Schwett bought a development card that, as usual, need to stay hidden from the other players, but just for the sake again for the tutorial, we'll see what he got. And he got a knight card, which is perfect for our explanation. Mr. Schwett has finished his turn and passing to me the dice. So I'm rolling the dice and what a surprise, I have a seven. When someone rolls a seven, we need to follow a few steps. First of all, all players are checking to see if someone has more than seven cards. In this case, they have to choose half of those cards rounded down and give it back to the resource bank. So just for the example, let's take a few cards. Let's say that I have here uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and one more because we need more than seven. I have here eight cards. In this case, I need to choose four cards, right, half. If I had nine, also I would choose four because it's half rounded down. And I need to give it back to the resource bank. So I will choose, for example, one, two, three, and the lumber and give back to the resource bank. The next thing that happens is that the player who rolled the seven, this case, it will be me, is going to take the thief and going to replace his position to another tile. So the starting position of the thief was on the desert island, but every time someone rolls a seven, he has to change the position of the thief. Now, I can change the position to any tile that I would like. Usually, it will be on a tile to block other players. So, for example, I choose to place the thief here on this tile. And that means that on the next time that someone will roll an eight, if the thief is still here, here there will be no resource production. It means that for the next time someone rolls an eight, only here I will receive a lumber, but Mr. Schwett over here will not receive his ore since the thief is on the tile. Furthermore, when I'm placing the thief here on this tile, I will choose the player whose settlement is adjacent to it and I will steal one of his resources. Now, in the case of Mr. Schwett, he doesn't have anything. Now, let's say that I chose to put the thief on here on this tile that the settlement of the yellow player is adjacent to. Then I'm going to steal one resource card from Mr. Onion. Now, in a real game, Mr. Onion will have to spread his card face down just like that and I will steal one of his resources. Now, just for you to know, according to Murphy Law, every time you will steal a card, most likely you will get the card that you absolutely don't need. So, after I rolled seven, and of course, nobody received resources, I'm continuing with my turn. I cannot do really anything with my cards, but I can try and trade with Mr. Onion for his lumber. So, Mr. Onion, would you like to trade? I can give you one ore and you will give me one lumber. And Mr. Onion is saying, nope, I absolutely don't want that. And we continue, since I don't have anything else to do with my turn, I pass the dice to the player to my left, Mr. Onion. Mr. Onion, roll the dice. We have a five. And a five means that here, Mr. Schwett and me are going to take each one wool. And the other five that we have over here, I'm going to gain one brick. Not so bad. Mr. Onion decides that he has nothing else to do on his turn, and now it's Mr. Schwett's turn. He would like to play his development card, but he cannot just do it yet. First of all, I remind you, the first thing that you need to do is to roll the dice. So he has an eight. An eight means that I take one lumber, 
and Mr. Schwet is getting one ore. So now Mr. Schwet is deciding to play his development card, which is in this case, the knight card. And when you play the knight card, it's pretty much similar to what happens when we roll a seven. Only in this case, nobody needs to get rid of half of their cards if they have more than seven. So when you play the knight card, you need to take the thief and change the position of it. Now, of course, it's not in Mr. Schwet's interest to change the position of the thief and use the development card. Maybe it's better to wait when the thief is actually on one of the tiles adjacent to one of his settlements or city. But just for the sake of this tutorial, he's going to do just that. So he's going to put the thief here, number three, which is going to block the yellow player and also the blue player, me and Mr. Onion. In this case, Mr. Schwet needs to decide from who he would like to steal a card. Now let's talk about one of the two special cards that we saw in the setup. One of them is called the largest army. Now, Mr. Schwet has played one of the knight cards and the first player who's going to put three knight cards in front of him will get to take the largest army special card, which is worth two victory points. He will then put it on his side and the next player who will have a larger army than three knights will get to take this card and put it on his side, which means that if Mr. Schwet has three knight cards and I would have had three knight cards, I cannot take this card from Mr. Schwet. I will need to have four knight cards. Also at the same opportunity, let's talk about the longest road special card, which is also worth two victory points. The first player that builds five consecutive roads will get to have the special card of the longest road. So let's just for this example, say that I have one, two, three, four, five consecutive roads. I will be able to take the longest road special card and put it on, on my side. The next player that will be able to take the longest road special card is the player that will have six roads connected to each other in a consecutive way. And then seven and so on and so on until you don't have in your supply any more roads. Now, just to be clear, these are not consecutive roads. We have here one, two, and then either three here or three here, but we cannot count it as one, two, three, and four. So we're back with advanced setup, and even here we have a few options for randomizing the game and spice it a bit up, especially after we already played a few games with a basic setup. So the first thing that I would like to talk about is the frame. Here in this example, I left it exactly as we did in the basic setup, which means that number three is to the north. Even though, even with the frame, we have the option to randomize it and putting the pieces together as we see fit or completely random. The next thing that we want to do is to shuffle the tiles and randomly, one by one, laying them down. So already we can see that sometimes we can have some crazy combinations, but for sure no game will be like the other. The next thing that we would like to do is to put the number tokens on the tiles. The most basic option with that is just laying them according to the order of the ABC, starting from the upper left corner and going on in this way. Pay attention that for obvious reasons, we skipped the desert tile. After we finished, all we need to do is to flip those tokens around Another option that we have for this advanced setup is completely randomize the number tokens. In this case, we'll just put all the tokens next to the board and one by one with no specific order, we'll just put them on the tiles. And so on and so on. Very th important thing that we would like to pay attention to is that if we have two red numbers adjacent to each other, we will need to take the last token back and put another one instead. After we finished with the tiles and the number tokens, it's time to decide who will be the first player. 
Each player on his turn will roll the dice and the player with the, wow, pay attention to that. And the player with the highest score starts the game. The first player then takes his settlement and puts it wherever he wants on the map, attaching to it one road. And then the next player clockwise will do the same. Pay attention that the distance rule has to be kept. The last player placing his settlement will be also the first player of setting his second settlement. And then going counterclockwise. And then each player will take the resources adjacent to their second settlement. And that's pretty much about it. And then the first player will start his turn. Et voilà. So I pretty much think that we covered everything from rolling the dice for resource production phase to what you can do in your turn, uh, trade, build, settlements, upgrading to cities, roads, special victory cards, what happens when someone rolls a seven and how someone wins the game. About my opinion of the game, I, just like I said in the beginning of the video, Catani is my absolutely favorite board game to introduce to people who are new to board games. So it's, it's, it's light um, with elements of strategy, but not too much because there's a lot of randomness uh, since every turn we need to roll the dice and our turn is actually dependent on that. Uh, so many times you will sit with a couple of friends, you'll play and someone will go like, what the fluff, nine again? These dice are fixed, it's not possible, give me another set of dice. So to be honest, it's, it's a lot of fun. I showed this game for quite a few people and it was really the piece of the puzzle needed to go from like really board games to what did you say Scythe was all about or even Anachrony or games that are considered to be a much heavier or much more crunchy than Catan. And that's it for this video. Guys, thank you so much for staying with me so far. I really appreciate it and I, I truly hope that I managed to teach you how to play in the easiest of ways. If you have any question or something that you would like to say, you can write for me a comment or by mail. Vous pouvez me contacter en français aussi, bien sûr, il n'y a pas de souci. I am going to also post a full explanatory playthrough of three or four players um, in case you want to see how it goes from A to Z completely. But um, that's it. So take care and see you next time.